Good morning. Hello. Welcome, everyone. On behalf of the Bachelor of Arts in Professional Communication Program and the School of Communication and Culture here at Royal Roads University, uh, we begin by acknowledging with respect that the university is situated on the traditional lands of the Esquimalt and Songhees families. We are delighted to present to you a highlight of the annual residency of the online BAPC program, a special guest lecture by James Hogan. Like many British Columbians one meets these days, uh, Jim comes from the province next door that must not be named. Uh, he was born on the wrong side of the tracks. Being from Calgary, these would be the sea train tracks. <laughs> He grew up with the Western myth of frontier justice, popularized by the likes of John Wayne, whose real name was Marion Morrison, and the Lone Ranger, whose real name only Tonto knew for sure. His earlier years were marked by a truly hands-on approach to communications, uh, mostly by way of the pugilistic arts, I believe. Uh, so from fighting in the streets in the oh, 1950s, um, he moved into the conscious expanding 1960s where he discovered Eastern philosophy, Buddhism and the work of Gandhi, which continue to inform his practice of communications and his writing today. Harkening back to his early years, he got further, tr further training in the art of meeting out and receiving justice, um, moving from uh, fighting in the streets to law school, which was I think a very natural and seamless transition. And from there though, uh, he went on to truly great things, building the PR firm of Hogan and Associates, specializing in crisis and issues management, and helping clients through public controversies, reputational disasters, and notably unfriendly court battles. Uh, Hogan and Associates has worked with many of North America's leading organizations, institutions, and businesses. Uh, Jim gives back a great deal to the community through uh, his work as chair of the David Suzuki Foundation, as executive, direct, as executive of the Urban Development Institute and Future Generations, and as a trustee of the Dalai Lama Center for Peace and Education. He helped establish the Suzuki Federation Business Council on Sustainability to encourage collaboration between environment and business, which is a key theme in his work. His interest in climate change and his commitment to ethical public relations converged when he co-founded the popular, dare I say, famous website, DSmog Blog, uh, tasked to identify unethical PR practices and expose flax trying to confuse the public on climate change. Uh, at this point, I'd also like to welcome two distinguished associates from DSmog, Emma Gilchrist, Executive Director, Editor-in-Chief, and Carol Linnett, Research Director and Managing Editor, here with us today. <laughs> Jim has explored his interest in professional communications in three books, Do the Right Thing, PR Tips for a Skeptical Public, Climate Cover-Up, the Crusade to Deny Global Warming, and uh, the one we'll hear about today, I think, I'm Right and You're an Idiot, The Toxic State of Public Discourse and How to Clean It Up. Besides exploring his deep interest in learning more about communications in the public sphere, it will be noted that in his books, Jim succumbed to the time-honored scholarly penchant for snappy titles followed by longer explanatory subtitles, and he did that beautifully. <laughs> today, he joins us to discuss what he sees as the alarming state of public dialogue in the world and how professional communicators and others can work to make it better. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome a truly extraordinary professional communicator with a profound respect for humanity, the earth, and repairing interactions between the two, Mr. James Hogan. Wow. Geez, that was an amazing uh, introduction. Thank you so much. Thank you for writing. Well, <laughs> boy. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, thank you. Uh-oh, it's bottled. No, no. OK, that's good, just in case. Sorry, you guys. I know that everybody's always looking for the hypocrisy, right? Um, so. 
so thank you for showing up. Uh, most of you probably have to, right? It's like <laughs> part of the uh, school year. And I've really been looking forward to uh, this. And I've been talking a lot to groups about my, my book. And uh, it's not, most of the time it's not communications people that I get a chance to, to talk to. So I've hired a lot of people like you. I'm, I was trying to think of, I probably have hired as many people over my career as are in this room right now. And uh, so I have a lot of personal relationships, a lot of great relationships with public relations people and communications people. And I'll try and kind of relate what I'm going to say about my book to, to what it is that you're going to be facing as PR people as, you, as your career evolves. I know many of you are already practicing and some of you will be. <clears throat> and I don't want to make any sort of statements that will lead you to believe that I think it's sort of an easy business that you just have to be more kind of ethical about. Uh, it's a very tough business. Certainly a lot tougher than when I started. You know, when I, when I started, I started uh, when I was in law school in the PR business. My wife and I were in law school together and we had a son and a lot of bills. And we, um, my summer job evaporated. Uh, when my wife and I got married, uh, shortly after this, she was in Alberta. She was the gold medalist in first year of law school, like the smartest student in the first year class. Um, and heavily subsidized by the Alberta government. Whatever bad things you may have heard about them, they were really good to my wife. And uh, <laughs> she was, uh, so she was being, you know, supported so that she could get through law school with a young son. And then she and I got married. <clears throat> and the day after, she gets a call from the government saying that all of this money that she'd been getting to pay her way through law school is no longer available to her because she's married. She's no longer a single mother. Right? So I felt immediately a huge amount of responsibility. Shortly after that, my summer job disappeared. So I basically went around and started knocking on doors. And I had done uh, for a couple of uh, groups like Amnesty International and the Students International Meditation Society. I had done you know, press conferences and set up special events and so on. So I was kind of good at dealing with media or learning. Um, and so I started knocking on doors in May. By the time um, September started and we were heading back to school, I had about, I hate to say this, I know it sounds terrible, it's so crass, but so I had about $200,000 worth of business lined up, right? Which made me realize that Maybe I had some kind of entrepreneurial thing about me that I needed to pay more attention to. And so as I was going through law school, um, I just let the business grow. And by the time I graduated, I had a dozen employees and a very successful PR business. And I kind of had the sense that I didn't like lawyers. You know, I just thought God is, you know, individually they seem nice. They're good friends. <clears throat> but as a group, they seem kind of mean, you know. And they all worked like seven days a week, and I taught skiing at Whistler, and you know, so I wanted to have Saturday and Sunday off to go to Whistler. And so I just kept doing my business, and it quickly grew into the top firm in Western Canada, and we've done all sorts of really interesting um, crisis work over the years, and I feel incredibly blessed. It's such an amazing business. You know, if you, it's so interesting. I, I know Nancy Spooner, who was uh, a very close colleague of mine for years and years. Um, we would say when we come to work in the morning, it's like not going to work. It's, it's just such an amazing blessing that it's so exciting, you know, you, that you have three of your clients on the front page of the newspaper in one week, you know, so the whole place, you know. Um, at the peak of my firm, it was about 25 of us. In Vancouver, that's big. Uh, it was the biggest. And uh, we, you know, one part of the office would be working on one crisis, another part in another. You know, so it, would, it was a lot of energy, and so we attract a lot of ex-journalists, and it brought a kind of an um, an ethical norm to 
all these journalists because, you know, some of you who are ex-journalists should know what I'm talking about, but journalists basically have a, a, a kind of programmed to take us all into account. They have a, a, a social responsibility about the way they think because um, that's their job, right? And if they've been doing it for 20 years and then all of a sudden they start in the public relations business, they often have trouble. But they bring that kind of ethical questioning with them all the time. That helped shape who I am. Um, I did my first press conference when I, in 1972. I know you guys, all of you were born after that, right? <laughs> Pretty much all of you. Uh, and it was oddly in Victoria with a monk from India. His name was Sachanand, and he was a meditation teacher. And uh, the last press conference I did, the last two press conferences I did, was with the Dalai Lama and with um, Al Gore. In Vancouver, <clears throat> when the Dalai Lama visited, uh, I had to moderate the press conference. So it was in City Hall. And it was the best attended. There were 77 zero reporters there being managed in this hot uh, space behind a rope by a bunch of huge RCMP guys. And the Dalai Lama showed up 45 minutes early. Now, think about that. I mean, being late's one thing. Being early for a press conference when you are the, the middle of the press conference is a very difficult kind of thing. But these people all still showed up, right? And then the Dalai Lama would never give a short answer. He, he would always go on and so on. And I thought, OK, you can't interrupt the Dalai Lama. You can't interrupt the Dalai Lama, right? And uh, right around not too long after that, I did the press conference with Al Gore in Montreal at the uh, climate meetings. <clears throat> and I remember around that time that I was, you know, I, wasn't, I was no longer kind of representing government and industry as much. And I was starting to do more what I would call social justice environment kind of work. And I remember looking at David Suzuki, who I spent a lot of time with, and the Dalai Lama, and Al Gore, and thinking, like, why is it they get standing ovations all the time? And coming to believe and understand that, that uh, big reputations come not from really good public relations, but from big values. And uh, it's sort of the luxury of being successful and kind of moving into a later part of your career, you're able to think like that. Probably wouldn't have been a very good thing for me to be thinking when I first started. When I first started, what I had to think about was being really, really good at what I did. So that everybody who dealt with me became an evangelist for me. So if there's any advice <laughs> that I can give you, it's that become very, very good at what you do because you're either going to have evangelists or terrorists, right? The evangelists are going to be saying good things about you and the other people, not so much. So I want to talk to you about my book. Um, when I started my book, <clears throat> it was just on the heels of another book called Climate Cover-Up, which is about propaganda. And uh, the working title originally was Duped and How. So I was actually going to write more about propaganda. And I sat down with this friend of mine. His name is Steve Rizal. He's a, a Canadian who works for the great American uh, communications guru, um, Daniel Yankelovich who's advised, I think, seven presidents. And he's a big pollster in the States who started this, this dialogic model of human communications that made it very popular in, in the United States. So I sat down with him in, just outside San Francisco in Sausalito at a really nice Italian restaurant. And we were, so I told him what the title of the book was going to be. And he was like horrified. He said, why would you put something like that on the cover of a book? because you're polarizing the conversation right at the start of, not even at the start, on the cover 
of the book. You're starting out a polarizing conversation. It's like saying, I'm right and you're an idiot. You know, at the time, I didn't really think that much about it, but after I finished the book, I, went, I decided the, how I was gonna retitle it was just read the book and find out the catchiest thing I could find. And I realized <laughs> that what Steve said, much to his chagrin, um, was very catchy. I'm right, and you're an idiot. Because it, and it, let me tell you, it has done amazing things for this book. Um, so that's where the title of the book came from. And I, uh, one of the things that that um, the idea for the book came from, there was a bunch of things that were happening at the same time, uh, and I, I, be, I was becoming kind of increasingly concerned about the gap between what I was hearing as I was on the, I was invited onto the board of the Suzuki Foundation in 2003. I became the chair in 2007, which kind of gives you an idea of how much David values at public education and communications. Um, but I was, he and I and the rest of the board, almost every board meeting, we have these conversations about why the hell people aren't demanding change. You know, this gap between what science is telling us and what we're doing, whether we're looking at the health of marine ecosystems, the extinction of species, the warming of the planet, all of these incredibly serious problems that are only gonna get more serious as we move from seven and a half billion people to 10 or so, whatever it's gonna be. Um, it, it just, I found it astonishing. And I remember watching television and I was thinking, I was watching this climate scientist on BBC debate this political guy who was representing uh, a guy named Inhofe, who's a climate change denier senator. Um, a Republican senator in Washington. And I remember looking at this debate and watching this climate scientist lose the debate. And, and kind of in general, in general, around that time, and I think even to a certain degree today, they kind of lost the debate. If you look at how serious climate change is, and you look at how little we're doing, but in this example on BBC, here's a guy I mean, the climate scientist at the end of this is caught on camera saying about the political operative, what an asshole. Uh, so this climate scientist law was losing a debate even though he has more credibility than the person he's arguing with. Even though he has all the science on his side and the other person has none. Most people trust the climate scientist and they don't trust this other guy. So what is that? You know, what's going on? And you look generally, I was thinking, you know, if you look at the debate around climate change, it's mainly about people shouting at each other. It's not about, it's not about, uh, the, we're not really talking about the evidence that much. And, and if you look at it as a communications issue, which is the way I, I tend to look at it, I'm not really an environmentalist in the classic sense of it, but I look at this as a communications challenge and I think, okay, there's probably been no major scientific set of findings that have received so many New York Times front pages and have been so high profile and so communicated as climate change. And yet, and then you've got all the facts on your side, and yet, you know, you sort of look at it like, what is going on here? There's something really disturbing about this. So David and I would talk about this quite a bit, and so that's in a way where this, this, this book came from. And what I decided to do was um, go around and talk to the smartest people I could find. And so I interviewed Peter Senge. I interviewed cognitive scientists, systems thinkers. So I went to MIT, I went to Harvard, I uh, went to Columbia University. Uh, I interviewed the world's leading, one of the world's leading experts on public trust in the House of Lords. I went to the Himalayas and interviewed the Dalai Lama. I interviewed Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, the famous uh, Zen Buddhist monk. Um, 
Roshi Jan, Joan Halifax, uh, who's a, a Zen Buddhist monk. Uh, I interviewed 70 people over a period of about four years. When I first, when I first put the transcript into the publisher, it was 130,000 words. <clears throat> and I felt like I could keep talking to people because this stuff is so complex. But I wanted to give you sort of a sense of, of um, what it is I, uh, I found. But first, let me, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. In, 2000, um, in 2012, uh, in January, I was watching television. <clears throat> and this woman came on. Her name was Catherine Marshall. And she was representing a group called Ethical Oil. And she said, Ethical oil is like fair trade coffee. Ethical oil is like conflict-free diamonds. It burns the same in your gas tank, but it's morally superior. And Canadians need to stop these foreign-funded radicals in British Columbia who are trying to stand in the way of a sovereign Canadian process and uh, prevent these pipelines that would get our ethical oil from the oil sands to the coast. So I remember looking at it and thinking like, what the hell? You know, that is like, that's like one of the weirdest communication strategies I've ever seen. It just seemed nuts. Like, who's going to believe that oil can be ethical? I mean, you, you know, you can't, oil is neither ethical or unethical. And but the whole argument seems so sort of bizarre, right? And so that was just the beginning, though. So all of a sudden, the Harper government started talking about ethical oil, right? And this is, these are some of the things they said. Uh, Senator Nicole Eaton said, uh, she charged these people as, she called them foreign-funded radicals. And she said they were involved in political manipulation and influence peddling. Uh, that there are billion, millions of dollars crossing the border masquerading as charitable donations. Joe Oliver, who was the Minister of Natural Resources, said, environmentalists and other radical groups threaten to hijack our regulatory system to achieve their radical ideological agenda. At the time, our environment minister was Peter Kent, and he said there was money laundering going on. Senator Mike Duffy called these environmentalists anti-Canadian. There was another senator, Don Platt, said, where would environmentalists draw the line on who they take money from? Would they take money from Al-Qaeda, the Hamas, or the Taliban? So it did get weirder. Much weirder, you know, uh, Terry Glavin at the time wrote that uh, suddenly we have sleeper cells of Ducks Unlimited popping up all across Canada. And so there's this very strange, all of a sudden, you know, you'll notice as a communications person, we're no longer talking about pipelines and oil sands and climate change, we're now talking about Canadian sovereignty. So what looks like something that's just you know, teetering on the verge of madness is actually quite clever when you look at the sort of reframing that it does. So I uh, decided that one of the first people I sat down to talk about this with, and, and there are a lot of other examples. There, there, we talked about a whole bunch of things. I mean, today you have uh, somebody who just got elected to be uh, president of the United States. Part of his message is that climate change is a uh, Chinese hoax that's being foisted on Americans uh, to undermine their industry. Now that is not normal, right? That is not normal. I mean, we think it's normal because we keep hearing it over and over again. You start to kind of, you know, your sort of resistance to nonsense kind of wears down. But it's not normal. There's something really odd about this. And there's a whole range in Smog blog. We've been writing about this for well over a decade, these kinds of strange campaigns. So anyway, but this one campaign, I talked to Alex Himmelfarb. 
And he, this Alex was the clerk of the Privy Council. He is a uh, PhD in sociology. Uh, he, uh, the clerk of the Privy Council is basically the senior uh, bureaucrat in the country who advises the cabinet and the prime minister. And he said, Jim, the idea here is to shut down public spaces. That's what's going on. They're basically trying to shut down the public square. That's what the whole narrative is about. He said, this is a quote from him, minimize public spaces where dialogue might occur. And where it does occur, confuse it, obscure it. The idea is to kill the debate, not foster it. And he said, and it's easy to kill public will. It's much easier than it is to actually mobilize public will to do something. You don't have to basically convince the public of much. You just make this kind of strange noise. Um, and he says the idea is that you're tr they're trying to convince people that everyone is just kind of pursuing their own interests and all the voices are the same. So everybody's biased. It's kind of like a everybody's biased message. Um, nobody's telling the whole truth. Um, so shortly after that, I met this guy named Jason Stanley, who's a philosopher of language at Yale. He, he teaches a course, actually, in propaganda at Yale. He was just in Vancouver. Just spent a few days with him in Vancouver. Amazing man. <clears throat> and he just wrote a book called How Propaganda Works. So I showed all this to him. And he said that uh, he said something very similar to what uh, Himmelfarb said. He said, the idea isn't to actually make an assertion or to, to convince people of anything with this type of strategy. What they're doing is basically um, trying to convince you that everybody's biased. There is no such thing as objectivity. Everybody's just kind of out there for their own interests. So David, there isn't anybody who really cares about nature. They're, everybody's up to something for some reason, right? So the idea is that they shut down public spaces, not by physically going and locking the door. They shut down public spaces by undermining our confidence in our ability to collectively have conversations. And so he, uh, he said, uh, ethical oil is a linguistic strategy for stealing the voices of others. The idea is to silence people by painting them as grossly insincere and thereby undermining public trust in them so that nothing that they say will be taken at face value. And <laughs> he told me this story that uh, Carol and I actually spent an evening with him on the, he, he lived in uh, Harlem. And you know, you may have seen a movie where people are kind of out on the roof in New York in a sort of a muggy, hot summer. It's kind of like that. And he said that uh, one night, he and a bunch of his friends from Columbia University were out on, you know, barbecuing on the deck, and they're sitting around. And they decide, and they started talking about Fox News. And so Jason said to these people, "Does anybody here think that Fox News is fair and balanced? You know, fair and balanced—that's their tagline, right?" And no one. Everybody said, no. And, well, do you know anyone who thinks Fox News is fair and balanced? And he said, uh, they said, no. I don't actually know. We don't know anyone who thinks Fox News is fair and balanced. So then he said, uh, do you think Fox News thinks Fox News is fair and balanced? <laughs> and so they, th they said, no, I, <laughs> we don't think Fox News actually thinks that. That the implications of Fox News saying that it's fair and balanced basically means nobody is fair and balanced. And if nobody is fair and balanced, why bother showing up in the public square? You know? So this goes right to the heart of what it is that you're going to be doing with your life. If people don't believe communications from other people, if, if, if we don't have the right to be respected with our views and the statements that we make in the public square, 
it undermines the whole fabric of democracy. We should be able to disagree vigorously without ad hominem attacks on us because our skin's the wrong color or because we're Mexicans or Muslims or climate scientists. This kind of silencing is a very, very serious thing and it will have impact, an impact on you. Jason Stanley, the other day, he's, he was giving a talk to a bunch of philosophy professors and students at, U at uh, UBC and he said, a problem, I know you guys up here in Canada are much nicer, but this is a problem that is coming to you. A problem that is coming to you. He was talking about Donald Trump. Um, so, <clears throat> so that's one part of this, the pollution. You know, uh, uh, you know early on in this, I, I, I came to, I, I interviewed um, uh, a fellow at Yale Law School, really amazing guy. His name's Dan Cahan. If you ever want to spend a bit of time learning something about polarization, uh, he has something called the Cultural Cognition Project. Uh, and I'll talk, talk to you about that in a second. But he said one thing he said that really stuck with me and I think is true. Just like you can pollute the natural environment, you can pollute public conversations. And part of the pollution is this style of propaganda. It's not about misinformation. It's not about lying. That's the simple part. It's about silencing. It's about muzzling scientists. It's an attack, it's an attack on the institutions that are in the business of mediating conflicting conversations. Media, courts, science, universities. And the idea is to just convince everyone that it's all just opinions. It's like the world of truthiness. And so you sort of look at that and you think like what the, you know, you, you want to like throw your hands up and like move to another faculty, right? So what do you do? I mean, there's questions you got to ask yourself about this, I'll, especially if you get onto the front lines of big issues. So, so that's one part of it, propaganda. Another part of this pollution in the public square is what, uh, is, is when, um, groups are able to actually massage partisan meaning into science. So, uh, so one of the guys I interviewed, his name is Jonathan Haidt, and he's also someone you might look up. Uh, he's done some really interesting work on the differences uh, the, uh, in the, uh, um, the moral matrix, he calls it, but the sort of moral uh, foundations of uh, uh, conservatives and liberals and why it is we have these kinds of fights and how it comes from this kind of moral foundation theory. <clears throat> so I interviewed him in New York, right actually the same day that I interviewed uh, Jonathan or, or uh, Jason Stanley. So he studies the psychology of teams and this is what he said. Human beings are tribal. We are oriented at birth to band together into teams and that, that why, while there's a lot of good that comes from co the communities that arise from that, it has a tendency to shut down open-minded thinking. He said uh, that once, uh, that he said, our righteous minds have been designed by evolution to unite us into teams, divide us against other teams, and blind us to the truth. We are divided in these highly polarizing ways, not because some of us are good and others are evil, but because our minds were designed for groupish righteousness. Jonathan Haidt said that we are intuitive creatures. We are not just persuaded by facts and logic, that things need to feel right first and then we'll go around looking for evidence to support it, right? So this is an important thing for all of us to understand. The feeling of communication, that emotional dialogue is by far and away the most important part of communications. I know you know that, but this is, I think this is kind of a living example of it, this whole kind of environmental, these crazy environmental debates. Um, 
Now, Dan, Dan Cahan at Yale, he took it further and he said, it's, it's not just that, Jim. We want to be misled. Team membership leads us to this powerful uh, need to uh, bond with our team. And so he's done all these studies that basically show you get somebody standing up in front of you and talking to a group of people, like I am, right? And you look at the person, he says, and the research shows that in or before you agree with what the person is going to say or is saying, you decide how much they're like you. Are they kind of on your team? If they're on your team, you kind of agree with them. You do agree with them. If, you, if they're not on your team, you disagree with them. And there's a fair amount of research into this, right? Um, and, and he calls it cultural cognition. There's researchers at Harvard call it my side bias. But this is a very, very powerful force. If I can convince you to join my team, you, even if it's for this, you may not even think about it that much. In the United States right now, the key determining factor of whether or not you think climate change is a serious problem is whether or not you're a Republican or a Democrat. Now tell me what the hell climate change has got to do with that. Nothing. Nothing. But it's like, okay, I'm joining this team or I'm joining that team and then I'm going to... So you don't even... Most people have no idea what climate change is. I mean, anybody here know how to take an ice core sample? No? I Me mean neither, right? But when you join the team, you basically start to take on the beliefs of the team. And I interviewed this other woman. Her name is Carol Tavers. She's an amazing social psychologist who wrote a book called uh, Mistakes Were Made But Not By Me. And her book is basically about why people don't like to admit they're wrong about something. <clears throat> and she said that it's this thing called cognitive dissonance. So anybody here? Heard about cognitive dissonance? OK, good. OK, so, <laughs> so, okay, so you're doing a good job here. Uh, so what she said to me was that, look, these forces that cognitive dissonance unleashes um, are every bit as powerful as thirst and hunger. And she said, so imagine this. She has this thing, I think it's called the pyramid of choice. So we have two friends at the top of this pyramid. And they decide, she, the example she used was, uh, one of them decides to cheat on an exam at university, and the other one decides not to. As soon as they make that decision, right at the very peak, they are at their most open-mindedness. Like they're, they're open to hear two sides of an argument. As soon as they make that decision, it could be a decision one of them buys a Hummer, the other one buys a Prius. You start to look for reasons, self-justification, you start to look for reasons that the decision that you made is correct. And that eventually, so it may be like a really inconsequential decision that you've made, but the way self-justification works is it's like a snowball, right? So you start sliding down here. And you may have been really close to each other up here and could have had a conversation at the bottom. You could not be further apart. And it all started from something that may have been not very well thought out, not really that important to someone, but it was a decision. And if it's made in public, if it's about your team, you will double down and many people around the world die to protect the decisions that you've made and the team that you've become part of. It's a very powerful force. So if you can convince people that climate change is not something that people like us believe, and if you do believe it, you can't be one of us, you must be one of them, that is basically the end of open-mindedness. And then it's the end of communications, right? All you have is a war. <clears throat> you, what you have is like unyielding one-sidedness. So as a communications person who maybe, you know, has horns, uh, why would I spend all of this money and time trying to convince you of something when all I have to do is like push you into the team and then after a while I can get you to believe damn near anything? 
So this is another source of pollution in public discourse. This is what propaganda tries to do. Um, now, in all of this, <laughs> you might like to think that the environmentalists are kind of like just innocent bystanders. But right around the time that ethical oil was coming out, they were calling the oil sands blood oil. Uh, they were accusing oil companies in Alberta of crimes against humanity. So it's like, it, you know, it takes two to tango, right? There's different sides to this. And one of the people that I interviewed for my book, his name is Roger Connor. He said, um, uh, what was it he said? He said, good. Uh, it's not about good versus evil, which is what Jonathan Haidt was saying, is right? It's not good versus evil. He said, it's good people doing bad things for good reasons. And he used to be like a, he called himself a name em, blame em, shame em environmentalist who sort of decided that he was oversimplifying the problem and perhaps making it worse. And he said, one of the things he realized as he started to understand some of the social science behind this was something he's written about called the advocacy trap. And the way the advocacy trap works is, <clears throat> so I say something publicly about something I care about, and you disagree with me. If, because it's public, think of Carol Tavares and, and these other people. Because it's public, and because I care deeply about it, and you come along and you disagree with me, I start to think, you know, first I think you're just wrong, and then I think, no, you might actually be up to something. You very quickly are, you become a wrongdoer, and it becomes a battle between good and evil. And I'm David, and you're Goliath, and I ask you this question. Tell me what's worse, self-righteousness? The blindness of self-righteousness or the blindness of denial? Which one of those does the most damage to a healthy dialogue? I don't know. You know, uh, it, you know <laughs> Peter Senge said to me, Jim, it's a mistake to think that people in the world are sitting around waiting for other people to tell them what to think. In fact, it's quite the opposite. People don't like being told what to think. And so the imperialism of environmentalism can be every bit as destructive to good public policy as the um, propaganda of the fossil fuel industry. And you guys are somewhere in the middle of all that. You know, you may not think that you have anything to do with climate change right now, but wait. <laughs> you will have something to do with climate change. Uh, and so, <clears throat> anyway, so that's the problem. This pollution in the public square caused by propaganda, polarization, and, and this style of advocacy. So I started asking people about this, this problem, and I ran into... Has anyone here ever heard of Karen Armstrong? That always amazes me. There's, so she's, you know, it's probably my age and yours, you're too young. Anyway, she was the uh, TED Prize winner in 2008. And they gave her $200,000 to make the world a better place. And she decided what she would do is pull together religious leaders from all these different religions to try and look at violence and, and conflict around the world. And... Um, she ended up writing a book called The Charter for Compassion. And it looked at, one of the things she said to me when I was interviewing her about this problem was, she said, um, what she found, what they found as they were doing this research was that, that virtually all of the major religions, like all of, and, and all of the major religious leaders, so whether you're looking at Confucius or Buddha or Jesus, or Muhammad, or any of these religious leaders, and uh, uh, you know, even people like Martin Luther King or Gandhi, that they all, at the center of what it was that they were teaching, was the golden rule. 
So you treat other people like you want to be treated. You don't do things to them you don't want them doing to you. And so she said, what they, the, when she looks at the environment, she says, look, we must speak out against injustice, but not in a way that causes more hatred. Remember what St. Paul said, charity takes no delight in the wrongdoing of others. Uh, Jason Stanley said to me, remember, you too could unknowingly be under the influence of bias. Um, and then Carol Tavares said, hold your beliefs lightly so that if something comes along that shows that you're wrong, that you can actually change your mind without feeling like an idiot. And so I was kind of in this state of mind thinking, oh yeah, we've we got to get along better, you know, we've got to be able to find more common ground. And, and uh, I'm watching uh, Bill Moyers, who uh, one of his editors just interviewed me the other day. It's an amazing organization, such an um, important voice in America. <clears throat> um, so, so Bill Moyers is interviewing Marshall Gantz, who features really prominently in my book. And uh, Marshall Gantz says, I have no time for these people who think there's too much polarization in the world. That's like dictatorships. What you get when you, in dictatorships, you get less polarization. In democracies, you want more polarization. And I thought, what the hell? You know, there goes the thesis to my book. My book was like largely written by that time, including the biggest chapter on Marshall Gantz. So I phoned him and I said, geez, I'm really confused. Like, what are you talking about, right? And he said, Jim, you need to read Rabbi Hillel. So I said, who's Rabbi Hillel? And he said, well, Rabbi Hillel was alive around the time of Jesus, but he didn't have as good a marketing team. <laughs> and I said, oh, okay. And he, and he said, and Rabbi Hillel talks a lot about uh, argument, public argument, good public argument versus bad. And so he, so he sent me all this stuff from Rabbi Hillel. So I'm reading it, and I think, very interesting guy. You know, thousands of years ago, this guy was talking to us today. And he said, there's argument for the sake of heaven, which is argument that's designed to help people get to the truth of a matter. And then there's argument that's designed to defeat and demolish people who disagree with you. And one of them is good, and the other one, not so much. And so, so my question for you, I mean, I want to leave a bit of time for us to, uh, for you to ask questions or for us to have a discussion. but. So my question is for you, just for a, as you're thinking about this, is um, how do you speak the truth but not to punish about climate change, pipelines, oil sands, I don't know, First Nations? You see a lot of anger out there, right? A lot of pissed off people. So David Suzuki and I, I'll tell you what two people told me. So David and Suzuki and I had this amazing afternoon. So David, me, and Gregor Robertson uh, ended up spending the afternoon with uh, a, a Zen Buddhist monk named Thich Nhat Hanh. Does there, anybody here know who Thich Nhat Hanh is? Oh good, okay, so you will know what I'm talking about here. This is like really special. So this guy was, he's in his 80s. He was a, a very close to Martin Luther King. He's written 100 books. He's next to the Dalai Lama probably the most prominent and important Buddhist Zen, and he's the most the senior Zen Buddhist monk in the world. So anyway, I got a call from uh, somebody saying, Thich Nhat Hanh is coming to UBC and he wants you to you know, publicize the visit to make sure people show up for the course and everything. And so I thought, oh God, are you kidding? I said, well, I, uh, absolutely, but the only thing is I want to come to the course. You know, My wife and I have been trying to get on a Thich Nhat Hanh course our whole lives and I've never been able to, to get on because they're always sold out. And so I, uh, so I, I agreed to do it, and they agreed to let me come to the course. And, and then when the announcement went out, it was like, like that. The whole thing was sold out. So that was the end of my job. There was like nothing to do. <laughs> so I thought, well, that was really a good deal. Um, so then I get a phone call from his monks. And, uh, and they said, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh would like to meet David Suzuki. Can you arrange that? I said, sure. Arrange that. And so I arranged it, and then I get another phone call. Thich Nhat Hanh would like you to facilitate the conversation. And I'm thinking, like, oh my God, you know, it's like I've died and gone to heaven. And so 
we end up at UBC, and I, I decided to make it a small group. So he, I brought like 30 people from the Suzuki Foundation. Thich Nhat Hanh, his monks and everything, they brought another, there was about 60 people. And uh, we started out by having tea. And uh, it was so funny because we're, we have tea. His assistant is like a PhD in theoretical mathematics or something, you know. And, uh, and we're walking up to the stage. And I had spent weeks on these questions. And Thich Nhat Hanh just looked at me and he said, from the heart. And I thought, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> from the heart, what does he mean, right? So we get up there and I thought, God, am I supposed to throw these questions away? I mean, it's a very, uh... so we end up having this amazing conversation. And, and in the middle of it, he says to, um, to Gregor Robertson and uh, David Suzuki, you don't have to tell people they're destroying the planet. They know they're destroying the planet. You need to deal with the despair. And you need to bring in meditation into your work on the environment. And so I was listening to this, and I, I don't know, maybe I was in a bad mood or something, because he's like, it's really quite special to be in this guy's presence, but it kind of annoyed me. I thought, are you saying we should just like head off to the caves or, you know, what is? So I said to him, you're not saying that David Suzuki shouldn't be an, uh, an activist, are you? I mean, Canadians expect him to speak up on behalf of the environment. And so he was like this close to me, like that about that far away beside me. And he has this way of kind of looking at you like he's like peering into your soul, you know, and you sort of feel like, I mean, it's really quite uh, special at the same time that it's a bit terrifying, right? Because he sees you. And uh, he looked at me and he said, speak the truth, but not to punish. Speak the truth, but not to punish. And I remember thinking, oh, you know, I felt like somebody like punched me in the solar plexus. And I'm walking off the stage. My wife is in the front row and she said, you heard what he said, right? Speak the truth, but not to punish. I mean, I'll never forget it. And I, it took me a couple of weeks and I thought, God, I've been given a Zen koan by the greatest living Zen teacher. And it's something that I've thought about a lot. And I was thinking about it when I went to the Himalayas to, to interview the Dalai Lama. We had this very incredible conversation. At the end of the, the, the interview, he reached out towards my forehead and tried to put his finger on my forehead. And he said, uh, we like to think the Western mind is more sophisticated. But in Tibet, we go with the heart. And I think that's stronger. So maybe if we take, because I was talking to him about climate change and the impact on Tibet. He said, so maybe if we take the Western mind and the Tibetan heart and we pull them together, we can fix these difficult problems. What we need is more warm-heartedness. So when you think about this, this uh, argument for the sake of heaven, and, and in a practical way, I sort of like want to come down from 30,000 feet for just a second. When you are working as a communicator, besides these attitudinal pieces of advice from these incredible people. Um, Marshall Gantz in my book, and you can find it online, talks a lot about uh, public narrative and, and what a powerful public narrative is. Without going into a lot of the detail in it, there's a couple of things that I just wanted to say. And that is that emotions will demolish facts almost every time. You have to have emotional meaning. There has to be values in the best communications. You have the, the best communications, the things that people are touched by, involves feeling. And feeling involves values. Feeling involves us. If you can talk about feeling and connect with people on a feeling level, you're telling a story of us. And that's the hardest thing to do. It's great to say, well, let's all just be like Martin Luther King. Let's all just be like Gandhi. But really, the story of us, the reason that, the David, that David Suzuki and the Dalai Lama and, to a certain extent, Al Gore now, is, who's become this amazing public speaker, 
get the standing ovations is because they are really good at telling the story of us, which is really ultimately so many of you when you're dealing with tough public issues, that's what you need to be able to learn how to do, tell that story of us. Today, because of the situation that we're in, I think the first question you have to ask yourself is, am I diffusing the polarization or am I reinforcing it? And if, I'm, if I am creating polarization, do I really want to work here? Right? Or am I doing it for a good reason? You know, am I speaking the truth but not to punish? You know, am I making an argument for the sake of heaven? And these are not things I can teach you. These are not things I can tell you. I can't explain this to you. This is, this is something you just need to, to, to be with. It needs to be part of how you shape yourself as a communications person. And people who get good at this, I think, they get good at communications. And people who get good at, com at communications communicate better. They enjoy their job more. <laughs> I can tell you, it's when you get better at it and when it actually works and when it means something and when the values are there that it really becomes enjoyable and you can feel like you're actually Fulfilled because you're contributing. Because it's so weird, you know, I would have never thought that what we do is right at the center of all this. Who would have thought that? I mean, I've always been at the elbow of important people. I've never thought I was doing anything important. I, I always thought like I was a backroom consultant, right? But actually, <laughs> what I've learned as chair of the David Suzuki Foundation is communication and human relations are right at the center of this. And all of those values and all of that kind of emotional relationship and, and uh, understanding and everything that we all think about as communications people is really what's either going to solve these really difficult conflicts or make them worse. And so I know I'm probably telling you all something you've thought about, but this is what I've thought about. And it's, uh, important. it's an important thing to think about. It's something that spiritual leaders through history have advised their communities for good reason. We have to know how to get along with people we disagree with. Being right's not enough. So, any questions? Before we begin the questioning, do you moderation or well, I don't know. Moderating, would, you, would it be fairer if you were moderating? All right, I'll be the moderator. <laughs> I, will, uh, I will make the following announcement. To encourage, uh, to encourage <coughs> questions and dialogue, our distinguished speaker has brought along three copies of his latest book. So uh, three top student questions, as judged by an impartial, unbiased jury, <laughs> <laughs> um, will uh, we'll, uh, we'll give out three books. So thank you very much. <laughs> touched on a wide variety of issues, which uh, uh, many of which we are endeavoring to explore in our uh, programs in the School of Communication and Culture. And in fact, your talk is, uh, is on the syllabus of, of my COM 490 course, so we're going to be working with that uh, in tomorrow's class. Let me know those of you at 490. Let's open it up for questions, please. Dwayne. Hi. Uh, thank you very much. It was a lovely talk. Um, I, but my area is not in, uh, in the environment so much. My, my sort of political geography is not in the environment. It's more in the arts, culture, entertainment field. And uh, I was struck a number of years ago when uh, a gentleman who was um, head of a number of organizations in uh, Los Angeles uh, referred to basically his, the, the large majority of uh, the people purchasing entertainment material as terrorists because they were uh, breaking copyright law. And I remember at the time being quite struck by it. why would he attack the very people that would you know, essentially provide his industry with a living. And I gave it 
quite a bit of thought over the year. I thought that was such a strange, absurdest thing to say. And then I realized that what it had done is it actually moved the center of compromise. That you know that it had pulled essentially where you know what a negotiated compromise would be, for the lack of a better term, to speak in binary terms, much further into the right. And that was much. It was very success, successful, in fact. You know, the conversation I felt really kind of switched. And then I thought, okay, well, if, again, I don't mean to be as binary as right and left. I thought, well, what's the counterpoint on the left? And I thought it seems to be satire. Satire seems to to, to balance that. But I, I've lost my faith in satire in the last uh, a number of uh, years on this because everybody gets a really good laugh, but nothing seems to happen as a result of it. And uh, I guess my, my question is, you know, when I look at this as a tug of war. You know, uh, it's it's like that. That implies there is a center, and that there's a you know some something hanging on a rope that says this is the center where it's getting pushed back and forth. How can any reasonable person try to figure out where that center is? Like you know, when you have two sides pulling so hard uh, on it, and I, I realize it's kind of a abstract question, but I'm. But I, but I wonder, like, you know, when, like you as a communications uh, expert would be somebody who got hired for one side. And you know, and it, there would be this sort of opponent system. Um, it seems to me somewhere somebody is deciding that you know what that geography looks like and how it's getting pulled left and right. Right. Yeah. No. And I and I think it's very issue specific. You know, it depends what the issue is because you know, as my friend, uh, oh God, what's his name? I've totally forgotten. Ed Maybeck says most people aren't paying attention to most things most of the time, right? So you've you, you've got that problem, like the, the disengaged issue. And then the engaged tends to already know what they believe and what team they belong to. So there's this. And so, so to me, that's how I look at it. It's sort of divided up in that way. Uh, and, and so I, I believe that there is um, a huge value in deep listening. That, that when you're dealing with highly conflicting uh, polarized sides, the trick is to convince the other side that you genuinely actually want to listen. You know, that you're in, even though, not, not that you are willing to agree with things that are wrong, but that you, that you're, that you deeply understand, right? That you, and I think what happened in the United States was you had this weird, in the last presidential election, I think it's a pretty good example of uh, one side uh, actually being weirdly more connected <laughs> right with these strange ideas and these you know conspiracies and so on and then the other side their narrative actually just being a, crit a criticism of that narrative right so you you didn't have so you had these values competing with no those values are wrong right so you had that kind of and so if you're looking at a, an election which is a very different type of communications obviously if you're looking at that I think what ended up happening from the people who were probably the bit, would have been the better people in, to run the country, uh, they just did a really bad job of connecting with people uh, outside of the kind of the core group of crazies that you're never going to talk to, but that other group that would have kind of come their way. And so, I, I mean, I'm not quite sure I'm answering your question, but I think it's it's in the it's in the deep understanding and the deep listening and the sort of getting people to feel like you're actually talking about something that has to do with them. Climate change really suffers from this because it's about polar bears, right? Or it's about disaster or, you know what I mean? And so it's distant, right? It, it's not about me. And so this deeply convincing in a polarized world that you are, that you actually care about the other person and you, you know, rather than the bullshit, right? I mean, there's just so much crap out there. People. You know, when you think of it, that we just don't know who to trust. We have, you know, social capital is going like this. The public trust is going like this. People are tribalizing, and you start to have this. And so I think the big thing is not, it's not how we talk, it's how we listen. And I think that actually can help move things. But it's not a, it's not, it's not my, in this world, I don't think it's not my right to tell you how to think. It's our job to try and find some place that we can change to that's, that's going to fix some of these problems, right? And the, so it's about the kind of conversation. And the conversation, I mean, I don't know you guys know this. It has to be. So I don't think of it as convincing people of something, because I'm more knowledgeable. You have to figure out ways, even if you are more knowledgeable, 
to have a conversation that will move you and the other person, and it's together. Uh, so I think these sort of things like speak the truth but not to punish and the sort of the common ground advice and all that kind of stuff have to do with just who we are as people and how we get along with each other. So, sorry, I know I'm not exactly answering your question, but it's sort of skirting around it. Oh, sorry. I, I, I tend to think that I'm open-minded on, on climate change. I, I don't lean one way or another. Um, that being said, you hear a lot of things on documentaries and all of those, these other things that uh, get you asking questions. So my, my question is, the, the world's been through a lot of quick changes, uh, some longer, some, some uh, quicker like um, ice caps in North America and all these other things. As, uh, as someone that works for the Suzuki Foundation, do you take these, um, these historical events into consideration? Uh, Fukushima, I, I just touched on this on an assignment, um, and, and uh, massive uh, marine life die-offs. Like, or, or, uh, Another big one that, that I heard about through NASA was a planet coming through the, the solar system. Uh, like all of these things might affect certain things in the climate. Working for the Suzuki Foundation, did they, did they take all these things into consideration? The, um, the, the climate science community, which is quite big, um, yes, they do. And, you know, they've taken, you know, various kinds of things with the sun and other, all of these other sorts of theories of where it may come from. All of that's been taken into account. And, um, you know, I've been, uh, not necessarily me anymore, but a lot of the people at D Smog blog early on and for the last 10 years have been writing about the sort of climate change confusion campaigns. Um, and if you get a chance, read. Uh, climate cover-up. Where, where I got to with this is, look, every single time I've started to look into, with D Smog Blog, we would start to look into an, an alternate theory. I can't think of any single one that had any science behind it. They all just kind of evaporate the closer you look at them, and before you know it, you're talking to the American Petroleum Institute. And I know that sounds very sort of like what it was I was just saying, it's not a good idea, but that is actually true. And so the National Academy of Sciences, um, the Royal Society, uh, every major scientific body in the world says that climate change is being caused by humans and that it's very serious. It's somewhere almost close to 100% certainty now, it's like 95%. So the doubt, so much of the doubt is uh, just has evaporated. And, and so, uh, yes, I'd say people have thought about those things, but there's a whole bunch of other people who are trying to shape the narrative in another way because they don't want these, these policies uh, changed. Yeah, are you gonna say something? I was just interviewing Jason Stanley last week, and we were talking about this, and he was raising how sometimes the, the whole polarization frame is problematic because it sets it up as like some people over here and some people over here and each of those groups of people have equally valid opinions and the answer is sometimes is somewhere in the middle. Right. And there's lots of topics on which that is the case, but there are also lots of topics on which that is not the case and that the people over here are actually just some, wrong, like factually wrong, and that the answer is it isn't always in the middle. Right. And he referred to climate change being one of those scenarios. Yeah. yeah, and I, that's what I thought as I looked at it closer. I mean, my background's law, not science, right? Uh, but the more and more I looked at it, I don't, there's not two sides to the story. There just isn't, I mean, in the science. I mean, there may be in politics, but that's not about the, that's not about the science, right? It may be that we don't want anything done about it. That's a totally different conversation, right? putting trust into your messaging, but how do we as like entry-level communicators express that to our superiors that there's value in communicating that way rather than automatically taking the easy way out and kind of jumping to the polarized crowd? Right. 
So, yeah, in fact, I'm dealing with one of those things right now. That's a very good question, because you, you, you have to be really careful with this idealism, right? Um, it's not that it's not right, but it, its applied value sometimes is limited. Um, I think that over the years, one of the things I've learned representing a lot of very wealthy, powerful people is a lot uh, of the reputational issues they've struggled with are self-inflicted. And so that a big part of your job is actually not straightening out the thinking of the person out there, but straightening out the thinking of the person that you're working for. And so, in fact, that is actually a bigger problem. And so you need to look at tools and resources and everything to, to make that happen. And you don't want to make a right thing to do argument. I mean, I did it when we won the Silver Anvil for the best crisis communications strategy in North America for the CAPERS hepatitis A outbreak number in 2003. And uh, I remember I got hired by uh, a company that eventually was gobbled up by Whole Foods. It, it was called Wild Oats. It was a big chain in the United States. And they were interviewing me from Boulder, Colorado. And I'd done a little bit of research. They were going to hire me or not. And on them, and I realized that most of their senior management were from Ben and Jerry's ice cream, right? So that these guys were like really sort of ethics-based people, right? And so uh, they, so one of them said, "So what what advice would you give us?" There was like six thousand people in the rain waiting for these immune shots, who were paying, you know, thirty or forty percent more for food that they were buying from Capers in, because they're concerned about immune problems that they had or you know health food and all that sort of stuff so they were people were angry and uh, so I said um, the approach should be this first do the right thing second be seen to be doing the right thing and third don't mix those two up always ask yourself what the right thing to do is don't get caught in the tactics or the strategy keep going back to that and it's so the argument I would make is that's that if, if you don't want people thinking you're an SOB, the first thing you have to do is stop being an SOB, right? I mean, that is the way it works. And so some people are not going to want to listen to it. And you're going to always be in that position where, do I really want to work for this person? Is this the right spot, right? So you want somebody to, and, and I gave that kind of advice for years and made money at it. So I think you can do it. You know, I'm, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but I think you can, you can have an ethical, uh, perspective that you bring to the table that is explained in a way that's practical so the person can see the business value in it. Andy, I, uh, progressively minded people often look at media outlets like Fox News or Breitbart even or in Canada let's say like the National Post maybe as uh, group, groups that, uh, that use propaganda as you're talking about, but look at it, open up any most daily newspapers, and what what major sections do we see in them? Financial, autos, right? There, there's no section on climate change, right? There, there are two major issues in the world today. One may end complex human civilization, one most likely will, nuclear weapons and climate change. There is very little press about these. When climate change is in the paper, there's a good chance there's going to be an ad for a, for a car beside it. Mm -hmm. So my, my question is, how much are all, like, like the, the whole of the mass media, how much is, is the entire thing a propaganda system? Yeah, I mean, uh, Jason Stanley, uh, who's like one of the leading propaganda experts, who was in Vancouver last week, he just says it's all propaganda, right? There's good propaganda and there's bad propaganda, so it's all propaganda. And so, I mean, that's true, and the, but the issue is um, for him, and I think this is partially true, is, is the, you know, if you think about the norms of democracy, what are they? Everybody's got to be involved in uh, decisions about public issues that they're impacted by. So you need fairness, reasonableness, inclusion. You know, these are sort of norms. And so you ask yourself, when you're looking at propaganda, is, 
is the propaganda that I'm involved in, because propaganda basically is this idea that you sort of circumvent uh, reasoning and go to emotions. So is the propaganda that I'm involved in repairing a tear in the norms of, pro uh, of, uh, of uh, democratic uh, principles and discourse, or is it undermining them? So undermining propaganda is demagoguery. It's sort of, it's the destruction and the demolishment of other voices that disagree with you. And so, um, you know, I, I think you're right, uh, but I think you can even go further and you can say like Peter Senge says is basically, we have created systems that we don't know how to manage. We have ourselves in a world where human systems around finance, around transportation, around energy around, uh, around investment, uh, the, all of these different systems are incredibly complex and they write themselves. And so you start to try to change it and it'll start to push back at you, even without the propagandists, right? So there is a, this systems problem is a big, is also a big problem. Um, anyway, read my book and, and you can hear what Peter Senge says about how you fix it. First of all, amazing presentation. Um, in the world where social media seems to be the way that we communicate, everyone has their own social media account. You can select what you want to see, and you can just as easily select what you don't want to see. Um, you can just avoid a whole topic if you don't believe in climate change. You just don't have to follow pages like that. You don't have to follow people who believe in that. So my question to you is, how do we break down that barrier to make everyone become on the same team when everyone can just select what they want to see or not see? You know, I can't believe you guys ask me these kinds of questions. I mean, they're so difficult. I mean, I understand what you're saying. <laughs> and I wish I knew the answer to, to that. You know, I mean, it's... Uh, well, I think it's a big problem that we're yeah, having. It's absolutely. separating everyone, right? As much as it brings us together, it also separates us. Yeah. And it, um, th there is absolutely no doubt that that is a big problem. You know, the whole... Um, where your, you know, social media allows groups to basically create their, their own kind of fact-free reality. Yeah. And that's a problem. And, and it, but even without social media, all of this stuff that I was saying about my side bias and, you know, tribes and all that sort of stuff, that still would exist. It just makes it a lot worse and a lot more angry. And I actually don't know the, I don't know the answer to that. I was at a, um, uh, a Haida celebration uh, a few weeks ago for a new uh, chief Gdansk, uh, a potlatch. And watching this community engage and do what it does. And I came away from that so optimistic, you know, that you have, that you, but you could see this community and it's, it's so rich and so real and so, so much the future, even though they're kind of you know, there's a lot of houses that aren't painted around there, but it, it's, a, it's a much more sophisticated place when it comes to that, right? And I, I think, you know, I, I think in a way that, you know, how you build community is a big deal. Uh, and whether or not you can, I don't know what you do with the rest of that craziness, but boy, it's, I think you, you don't want to waste your time having a fight with it all the time. bringing journalists on board, former journalists on board, communications professionals, and how they sometimes face ethical challenges making that switch. Over the years, I'm curious to, to know some of the things that you said to former journalists who you brought on board with your firm to help them get past some of those ethical challenges that they dealt with. Yeah, uh, it was interesting. We, I hired the, uh, uh, a fellow named Gerald Proselandis, who was the business editor of The Sun. and. Uh, He'd, he'd been with me for about a year. He's like brilliant, really interesting guy. He'd been with me for about a year. And all his guys like David Baines and all these guys from the Vancouver Sun invited him out to lunch to say, you know, how is it? You know, what's it like being on the dark side? <laughs> and uh, and, and <laughs> Gerald afterwards told me, he said, what, I said, what did you say to me? He said, what I said was, you have no idea the forces assembled against you. <laughs> and, and it's because I spend a month on a news release, you spend an hour. Who's going to, you know, 
rise to the surface around that, right? Um, I think that the, the way that, that what it, it's exactly what I was talking about, right? It's, it's in the, you have to convince this kind of talent that you are doing your best to do the right thing or you'll lose them. And so it changes you. I think one of the reasons why I'm so kind of ethically driven by this is that th these people, the pressure that I got from my team to, you know, I'm not saying I was a dishonest person, but, you know, dishonesty is not necessarily as blatant as we might think it is, right? You're just kind of like doing your job. But these people are constantly questioning, and if you give room to that, it helps that. And they, they can feel like they're doing something that's constructive and good and, you know, something that they're kids aren't going to be ashamed of them for. Um, you're mentioning that climate change has really split down political lines and that we're very much um, team and pack mentality oriented. And um, I was just wondering sort of what cool initiatives you've seen in, from a political standpoint of things that are happening to kind of combat that and, and right. bring, sort of bring in the yeah. areas, I guess. Yeah, and there's really great work being, what, what is the name of that American senator who's done all, the, the guy who lost his seat to a Tea Party guy because he said that climate change was a problem? Uh, there's a, uh, and sorry, I'll try and remember it and, and, and pass it on to you. Yeah, Catherine Hayhoe, the work, Canadian who lives in Texas now is doing this whole kind of talk, you know, talking to Christians about how a Christian can believe in climate change. And, but this guy... Uh, I was at a Yale conference, and there was a group of them, a bunch of social scientists, working with this ex-senator who lost his seat because he said climate change is a problem. And what they're doing is, is looking at how you can talk to Republicans about climate change. And you can, they showed all sorts of examples how you can get Republicans to support uh, carbon tax, pricing carbon, uh, doing a whole bunch of different things. The thing you need to avoid, they said, and be really clear about this, is you can't demand that they admit they're wrong before they start to agree with you, right? Which is, <laughs> that's the self-righteousness problem, right? I, it's not just that I want you to support good public policy. I want you to admit before you do that that you are like dead wrong about this and so stupid, right? <laughs> that doesn't work, right? And it's not quite as blatant as what I'm saying, but there, you know the, the vibe I'm talking about, right? And so uh, I will get the name, uh, because this is really interesting work, and it's, there's a lot of data there. So they, they're not just ideas, right? OK, we've got time for one more. Me? Oh, you. Oh, yay. Uh, <laughs> so people don't like to be told what to think, right? And when people make decisions, they want that reinforcement as they, you know, they're looking for reinforcements for the decisions. And denying climate reinforces um, you know summer holidays with your family with the trailer and the car and the right it, it reinforces the good jobs that pay plenty of money for people who you know maybe have a grade 10 education and they can have you know cars and houses and they're you know good time like what what uh, Trump is trying to hearken to when he says make America great again right like where we all had jobs and everybody was happy, right? Um, and on the on the other side, you have uh, the you know uh, people who believe in climate change saying horrible, horrible, horrible things are going to happen instead of say instead of drawing on those things that right. reinforce our what we already want, reinforce that choice, right? right. And making that choice. Like, what do we want? Instead right. of horrible, 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 how about, and just as an example, and I, I mean, but the, the nature, or the air, or the, anyway. Yeah, yeah. and I, I agree with that. I yeah. mean, I, I, think, I think that the people who are doing the best work are the ones who are painting the path forward, right? And, you know, I went to uh, the oil sands with Suzuki a couple of years back. And uh, just as we we're going to go up, I thought, oh God, we don't have any security people. And uh, so I, you know, I phoned this friend of mine. He said, ah, I'm the only security you need. He's this big six foot four guy. And I thought, mm, this, thing doesn't, this isn't going to be good. So we go up there, and we end up in one of those hotels that has a bar for a restaurant. Yeah. 
So down we go at 7 o'clock into the bar, and I thought, oh, God, here we go. So we're sitting down there, a small group of us, and the first guy who comes up to our table looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger, except like 6'5". And he comes up, and he's like seriously a big guy. And I thought, oh, I knew it. I knew it, right? And he comes up, and he says, oh, I just wanted to shake your hand, Dr. Suzuki. You know, I'm so supportive of everything you do, you know, so keep it up. You know, keep up the good work. But, you know, just don't go really fast at it, because I have to finish paying off my mortgage back in, yeah. in, uh, in uh, Nova Scotia, right? And by the end of the dinner, his David was sitting. He's not really a drinker, but he was sitting there. I bet you there were like 40 drinks in front of him that people had bought him and people had come over, you know, to say, you know. And it was so, it was so totally different than what I assumed it was, it was going to be. And I think that that's kind of what I'm talking about is this, we, when you get into these groups that sort of live in isolation, uh, that it's very dangerous because the solutions are not going to happen from you and your friends over dinner, right? You're going to have to figure out some way to reach across and deal with the real problems. People have to work. You know, we have to, we can't just kind of stop this stuff, right? And so, you know, there are people who are working on clean energy and so on, and I think that that is this kind of bridge building. It, you know, you are moving into a world that's way more complicated than anything I had to do with this, these kinds of problems. They're going to be influencing virtually everything that any of you are going to be doing. And I think bridge building and finding common ground and the sort of deep listening stuff, those are the skills. You know, you do need to know how to write. You do need to know how to speak. You do need to know how to manage a meeting and facilitate sessions and strategies and develop a plan and all that kind of stuff. But nothing is important as listening. And in its deepest, deepest way, you've got to help people you work for listen. And it doesn't matter whether you're at the David Suzuki Foundation or at CAP, in, in my view. Anyway, thank you so much. It was great to spend this time with you. program, the School of Communication and Culture, and this great Royal Roads University. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.